in to listen to this uh, YouTube live. So this is the first time I conduct YouTube live. So let's say if there's any hiccup, please be patient with me. And I purposely choose this uh, presentation is because I made this presentation with a group of friends before. So is this is not the first time I presented on, on this topic. And actually in my past video, I also presented on um, TSMC quite a few times. So if you look back those old um, videos, I think um, it, you will see a similar thing. Uh. But uh, nevertheless, I have added a couple more uh, latest information in, in the slide deck. So that I hope that, um, I mean, that actually give you some updates. Uh. It's not like all, all the materials are old content. Okay. I hope that uh, the line is clear. Let's let get started. Hope that we can finish this uh, soon. Okay. So um, I'm where I'm coming from, right, is like I, I just assume that someone who's li listening to this presentation as someone who's new and uh, don't know about TSMC because uh, unlike companies like, you know, Apple, Microsoft, where we, we use their products day-to-day -day basis, but when it comes to TSMC, actually, uh, I would say that if you just uh, go and pick up someone random from the street and ask, like, do you know what is TSMC? The likely answer is no, because TSMC is a B2B business. They only sell to other businesses they don't have to do a lot of all this, you know, like marketing, advertising, so that people know them. They don't need the, the you know, like the public people know about them. They only need to uh, sell it to like big companies, like, you know, like Qualcomm, uh, Apple, uh, Nvidia, and so on. These are their customers. Okay, so, so that's why I'll, I'll start it out, uh, assuming that you don't know. So we start from scratch all over again. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the business model. So, um, for the business model, I think this is uh, this this uh, the semiconductor value chain showing here. This is the landscape or, or different roles but played by different companies in the semiconductor sectors. So as you can see here, there are companies that do design. There are companies that do the EDA or electronic design automation. Then we have equipment companies. Uh, I think the, the famous one is ASML that produce the EUV machines. Then we have companies that specialize into raw materials. There are companies that specialize into assembly, testing, and packaging. Uh, some of these companies actually in, in Malaysia, uh, I, I think Malaysia is, is doing uh, quite, quite a fair bit on this uh, uh, area. And then there are companies that are you know, so-called the uh, pure play uh, foundries. These are companies like TSMC, UMC, and Global found Foundries. And then there are companies that only do design, which is the fabulous uh, design company. The famous one are, you know, companies like NVIDIA, AMD. They, they don't have their own fabs, right? So uh, after they design their chip, they will just pass it to companies like TSMC or Samsung um, that, that help them to, to manufacture the chips. So these are like uh, what I call the like pure software um, semicon companies la. so they only do software part the hardware the, the you know like the dirty works they all pass to mostly Asian companies la, which is uh, mainly I would say TSMC and Samsung and then there's also those like older uh, way of semiconductor older way of doing semiconductor business which is companies like Intel uh, and so on these are companies that do their own design and then do their own manufacturing so you can see if you just plot like all the companies in this chart, right? This is like the entire, almost like the entire ecosystem of semiconductor companies. And then they all work closely with each other. Say for example, you know, like um, TS TSMC, uh, these are their customers, like NVIDIA and AMD, and their equipment, equipment manufacturer are companies like ASML, uh, Applied Materials and so on. So they work very closely uh, with each other and they really specialize in their own area. For example, TSMC won't suddenly go to like produce uh, some UV equipment because first, they don't know how to do that. And secondly, uh, just let those who are good at their area do the, their job, right? It's a lot more efficient and a lot better. So I think the, the overall trend is that uh, we are moving from the IDM models, which is the model used by Intel, um, doing their own manufacturing, doing their own designs towards more like fabless and um, foundries models. Later, I will go into more details on why this is the trend uh, and, and what are the uh, advantages of, of the foundry model. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the top customer. Um, as you can see, uh, I only have 2021 data here, but I believe 2022 isn't that different compared to 2021. Uh, you can take this as the reference. And TSMC largest customer is Apple. Um, almost like, you know, about one fourth, one quarter of the business is actually taken by uh, Apple. And because Apple solely, as of now, they solely rely on TSMC. So, so when it comes to, you know, like the, 
allocations of the uh, manufacturing capability. I think Apple they 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 have like a uh, how to say they they will chop the cap capacity first, and then the rest right it, it really depends on uh, whether there's extra capacity or not. Uh. So um, this is the good thing if you are the big customer, you can dictate the capex of the companies and so on. But anyway, they they are not like I mean companies like Apple, MD, they are really relying on TSMC so they have to work very closely with TSMC to, to uh, explain to them say for example their, what's the up, upcoming demand and so on so that on TSMC side they can plan the future um, capacity uh, increase and so on they, they need to build fabs right when it comes to all this like uh, increasing capacity so they have to you know communicate with each other um, uh, closely and then uh, let's look at the revenue share. So uh, in, in this pie chart, right, I only show the total um, you know, on the foundry models. That's why you don't see Intel here. So uh, under the foundry models, uh, the largest one is TSMC. The, their market share is actually more than half. So you see 54% is coming from TSMC. Uh, the other, for example, like Samsung, UMC, these are still big. Uh, but there's also very like all those small ones. And the small ones usually they are specializing into uh, mature nodes, uh, meaning that meaning that those fabs, right, they already built in the past and then they they, they just maintain it. Uh. Whereas for those advanced process nodes, for example, like those like seven nanometer, five and three nanometers, uh you can see that in, in those advanced process nodes, right, TSMC and Samsung they basically like uh take up almost hundred percent of the market share. Uh. So there's only um, one or two uh, players on, on the advanced node. But nevertheless, I think uh, Intel is still trying to get into the advanced uh, process nodes. So they are spending a lot of capex to, to get into that area. Okay, you can see that this uh, 54%, right? This is not like a, a one-off data points, right? If you track uh, in, in the past uh, quarters, TSMC has always uh, like ha has been maintaining this kind of market share for many quarters already. So th there's a reason why they are able to command such a uh, large uh, market share. Uh, I'll go into more details in, in the later uh, slides. So uh, what's the thesis of investing in, in um, TSMC, right? So we'll go into like a, a couple of imp important ones. So I, I started out to, to say this law because uh, most law, right? This is the law that anyone who study um, semicon they will able to quote this law, uh, okay? So let me read it out. Uh, most law is the observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit or IC doubles every two years. So you can see that um, like they, they keep cramping more and more transistors into the chip and, and make the chip much better uh, and m much more efficient. So, I mean, if you know, like, um, how to say, exponential growth, right? If you can double it every about two years, right? Um, it, it, you see that the exponential charge is going up and up and up. So, so it's, it's very, how to say, this is the things that power all the innovations in, in the tech industry. No? But the second Moore's law, uh, which I don't think many people know about this, right? It, this second Moore's law, or, or called the Rock's law, right? Says that the cost of semiconductor chip fabrication plant doubles every four years. Not many people know about this. So the, the question is like, okay, we, we know that if you want to build a fab, the cost just like double every four years, but what was the implications, right? Okay, so that's why that's uh, that's the topic that we want to get into here. So you can see here, uh, this is the capital expenditure in the global semiconductor industry. So you ca you can see that the um, capex keep increasing and increasing when they have to move from um, seven nanometer to five to three nanometers. That the cost just skyrocket. Okay, but usually uh, cost skyrocket doesn't sounds like uh, interesting things, right? Because uh, higher cost means that lower profit for, for the FAPs, right? But uh, for TSMC, I, I think this is something that actually helped them uh, rather than hurt them, okay? So what happened is that you can see that um, uh, during, you know, when, when uh, in many years back when they're still producing 14 nanometers, there are quite a number of competitors. So almost not everyone, but the big ones, right? Say for example, from TSMC, Samsung, Intel, SMIC, and Global Foundries, they're able to produce 14 nanometer. And then once you go to 10 nanometers, you can see that, okay, uh, slowly there are less and less players. When you move to seven nanometer, actually only TSMC, Samsung, and Intel are able to do that. SMIC is the question mark here because they say they are able to do it. It's just that there aren't that many like uh, credible information out there to, to say that not only they able to do that, but they're able to do it at, at a cost uh, efficient way. So this is more like a question mark here. 
But when you go to five nanometer and later you go to three nanometers, there, there's not many companies can do that. It become like almost like a monopoly business. Um, three nanometer, I think only TSMC and Samsung able to do that. Uh, Intel is try, trying to get into like five and three nanometers, but we, we still yet to see their result on this area. What happened is that although we, we tend to see semiconductor as like a big in the industry, but actually, if you go into more details, you will notice that at, at the pro advanced process nodes, actually there's only like one or two companies, meaning that when, when they have monopoly power, they can dictate the prices. So that's the point that I try to get into, which is that um, all these like TSMC and Samsung, because they, they have a monopoly, so they, they have strong pricing power there. That's why they're able to get a very high gross margin and, and net margin stuff. And then the second thesis on TSMC is that they, oh, they, they continue to you know, like improve their R&D and, and then just to make sure that they are at the forefront of the technology. Uh, in the past, that isn't the case because if you look at TSMC his history, in the past uh, when uh, Maurice Chang just started TSMC, in terms of R and, uh, technology and R&D, they, they are quite behind, behind of uh, Intel. So, because Intel uh, essentially invented this area, so what uh, TSMC uh, is, I mean, essentially they are behind. But all the money that they earn, right, they actually pour, pour back into the business and hence they are able to keep working on their R&D and uh, push the, pro the process node, become more and more advanced. And right now, they are already at a 5 nanometer as of 2022. Uh, 2023, they will start produce the 3 nanometers, uh, which is the so-called the leading edge process nodes. Uh. So this, if you invest in TSMC, you need to make sure that they, they stay at the forefront because say for example, if they slack in their R&D, they, they just slow down and then suddenly uh, Samsung or, or other companies like Intel catching up, right? So they, they will lose their pricing power. So this is something to watch now. Okay, so the next question that I want to ask is that is TSMC better than Samsung? Because just now we said that there are like two uh, companies that are able to produce five and three nanometers, right? So actually, when it comes to like whether they are able to um, arrive at, you know, uh, hit the three nanometer and so on, uh, Samsung actually is even uh, more advanced than uh, TSMC. They actually, I think they, they came up with the three nanometers before uh, TSMC and they went into the uh, GAA fat before TSMC also. So if you look at the technology, right, just, just purely at the technology, you would thought that, okay, Samsung actually they are not that behind. It, it, in fact, they are actually more advanced than TSMC. But there's one thing that, uh, I mean, based on a, a couple of data points is that there's one thing that we see that Samsung do, isn't doing that great as compared to TSMC, which is on the U. So U, right, um, is for in semiconductor uh, industry, essentially that's the... Uh, when you do all this manufacturing, there will be parts that is like, like the results right, or, or the products that you created, right? There will be some defects. And then if you come, if it is defective, it means that you have to discard them, it cannot be used, okay? So say for example, if somehow something wrong in the, in the manufacturing and the yield is only 50%, uh, that means that like almost half of the chips that you produce, right, you have to throw away. So if you throw away 50% means that you, you yeah, for the same cost that you are you are running right because all the equipment you already bought like expensive EUV and so on you go and do the stuff and then suddenly you get fifty percent that is working. What it means is that the cost right per per chip right is a lot higher. So so that's why uh, aside from whether they are able to produce uh like so called the five nanometer at three nanometers the other thing to watch out for is the U whether the U is high enough because uh, if the U is very low, uh basically your cost per chip become very high so it's very hard to make money especially if your U is low and your competitors U is high say for example let's say um, Samsung U is only 50% but TSMC is able to get 70 or 80% so so if that's the case right TSMC can price it at the uh, cheaper price and still be profitable and for you, you have to match the price because you, you cannot simply charge higher because because of your uh, yield is low, right? So so that will hurt your business. And uh, if your yield is like much lower and you can't even supply enough um, a product or, or chip to your customers, that will hurt your reputation and that is even worse, right? So so I think this yield is something that that um, 
I, I, I think we all should pay attention to, which are usually not widely reported. Uh, so you have to pick up like all these uh, pieces of data and, and just to have a feel whether they are doing good or bad uh, at, at their yield. And, and this yield numbers, right, it's not just like, okay, Samsung or Samsung usually average this yield and TSMC much higher. It's really depending on uh, each of these uh, process nodes. Say, for example, now they move to three nanometers, you actually don't know what's the yield. And the U may start out low, and then as they improve, it become higher and higher. So, so it's really that you have to track uh, one tranche at, at a time to make sure that, okay, whether they are doing well or not. If they are not doing well, then uh, we, we all should expect that they are, the financials, they will get will, will be lower in, in the future. So, so these are the things that, that we should watch out for. And come back to Samsung, right? Actually, um, if you look back over 2022, um, yes, technology, they are more advanced, but when it comes to you, the, the number it isn't that good. Say, for example, this piece that I'm getting from um, uh, this article here, they're saying that the Samsung foundries, uh, the U is only 35%. Uh, 35% is actually very low. Um, so, so I think that actually caused Samsung to lose some business because all these customers, if they are not able to get enough chip from, from Samsung, and Samsung still need to supply to their own, you know, like Galaxy phones and so on, right? So all these customers, they will go, go to TSMC and they go elsewhere to, to suck. To, to secure their chips. If not, they don't they don't have the chips, they can't produce their, their products, right? So that, that's the situation that, that Samsung is facing. But I have to say, this is, you know, it keeps changing one because uh, as you track, if they have some uh, good improvement, um, this 35%, it, it can increase, uh, which I think towards the end of 2022, I saw a couple of uh, data points showing that there's, there's some improvement. It's just that uh, they, they aren't very clear picture that shows that, okay, um, the yield has, has improved. Uh, so yet to see. But but uh, just want to I mean the summary of this this slide is to tell you that pay attention to this you when when it comes to um uh, uh, competition between TSMC and and um Samsung. Okay um just now I'm, I was showing uh Samsung now uh, TSMC as you can see their the the reported numbers right is that their U is very high for uh ranging from sixty to eighty percent. And I think even for, for both three nanometer and for five nanometers, they are very impressive. Uh. That's why, um, th that is why I, I would say that at least for this three nanometer and five nanometers, uh, TSMC is doing well. And there's a reason why why that's the case because, uh, for TSMC even for three nanometers, they are still using uh the FinTech technology, which is not the most advanced one. Whereas Samsung, they they try to move into the GAA fat, which is the the next uh thing, right? So. So they are taking a little bit more risk here, meaning that they try to uh, embrace newer technology. But as the technology is new, there's a lot of things that they, they haven't worked out and they haven't mastered it, right? So so they have some problem on, on their yield. But the good thing is that for Samsung is that they will uh, accumulate more experience dealing with GAF as compared to TSMC. La. So that's the things that, that um, I mean, looking forward, let's say when TSMC moved into GFA, then you really have to pay a close attention to what's their yield number. But as of now, talking about their numbers for 2023 uh, or even 2024, they are, they are okay because three nanometers, they are doing uh, very well. Okay, um, so just to address uh, the competition between Samsung uh, and Samsung Foundry and, and TSMC, let's move in, into financial uh, and, and their valuations. Okay, uh, just this morning, uh, TSMC an announced their financial reports because uh, only when they announce the financial reports, which have a lot more details, uh, you, I'm able to like dig up all this information here. The the Q4 numbers that they they uh, publish, right? That one you you can only see the the you know like the top line, uh, the bottom line, and so on. They don't have all this detail breakdown showing how much revenue coming from which process notes and so on. So this this bar chart here that you are seeing here, this is just uh, like fresh out from the oven this morning. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's this morning because uh, I think yesterday or, or the day before I checked, it, it hasn't out yet. But uh, this morning I checked, it, it was out. Uh, so I quickly pull out this uh, data and then present presented here. So how to interpret this chart? Okay, uh, you can see that the blue one, this is five nanometer. This is the red one is seven nanometer and yellow is 10 nanometers. So, um, you know, like this, these are the advanced process nodes uh, uh, at the bottom. And then those, you know, like coming up since uh, 2019, these are the so-called the matured nodes. Uh. So as you can see, uh, 2020 Q3, they started out uh, coming, coming with five nanometers. And then since then five nanometer has increased quite uh, 
like like this is how it works right it started out slow as they ramp up the process you can see that more and more uh, of their revenue actually contributed by this uh, five nanometers and from 2023 q1 onwards you will see a different new color here uh, which is coming from the three nanometers because they, they just started up producing uh, three nanometers since um like the current quarter uh, which is q1 so as you can see those uh, mature process nodes, right? They tend to be more const more constant. They they are still increasing. Uh, I think partly also because they they check up the price. Uh, and that price actually contributed to higher revenue. Uh, but in in terms of growth, I think most of the growth will be contributed by the advanced process nodes, uh, which is like all the five and three nanometers. Uh. So this is um this is the 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 picture that we are seeing here. And for seven nanometer, you you notice that for Q four, it actually shrink. That's why uh in a total revenue uh, basis actually 20 q4 is slightly lower than q3 uh i, I think the fan five nanometer actually uh, supported their growth if not they will be in negative uh, growth uh, sequentially but the five nanometer this is the one that supported now but you look at seven nanometers because i think there's some slowdown in smartphone and pc markets that's why the the seven nanometers actually string now, uh, at least for for q4 okay uh, I think they they communicated that Q1 also we will we will expect to see some shrinkage, but from let's say a uh, second half of 2023 onwards we will go back to growth uh growth uh, mode again uh. so so this is some there's some cyclicality in terms of their result especially if you look at all these like seven nanometer uh, and and sixteen or all the uh, matured nodes uh. but for the advanced process nodes say for example like uh, five and three nanometers i think they, they are still having a nice growth uh, th thanks to all these you know like uh, high the hpc uh, uh platforms okay um okay this is the revenue breakdown by platforms as i mentioned this is the new data you, you can see that the smartphone actually uh decreased slightly but the hpc hpc i think mostly these are you know ch uh, let's say like the data center chip and and some uh, basically all, all the enterprise business i think i think they fall under the hpc i think uh, let's say like apple ipad i think also fall under hpc because th that one is not under smartphones right so so there are, there are a couple more it's under hpc la. so you can see that uh, in the past right actually smartphone is the largest uh, revenue contributor uh, but now you can see that hpc is actually like you know um, slightly larger than smartphones la. So this is the, the red color, the HPC is the one that, that is like push, uh, driving the revenue growth for 2022 and also for 2023. Okay, this is not updated by the way. Um, this is just some chart I pulled up from Macro Trends. As you can see, the um, growth rate right is like uh, about 35% growth. Uh, I, I think their growth rate for 2023, I don't expect them to maintain like 35%, but it should be, you know, like between 20 to 30%. Uh, so so they, they are, you know, TSMC, because they already have the uh, market share of about like, let's say, you know, like 50 to 60%, right? It's actually hard for them to grow their market share anymore. But then uh, the entire industry the, or the entire pie is growing and the cheap prices is also still increasing. That's why um, in terms of their revenue, they are, they are still increasing. Uh, and these are the growth rate that we are seeing. Let's look at their profit margin because uh, if you can grow but you don't have profit margin, it's also useless, right? So so let's look at their, their profit margin and you can see that their gross margin is quite high at 57%. Some of this uh, growth, right, is actually, um, by the way, this is old numbers. Uh, the, the latest Q4 one is probably close to about 60%. And this is not really sustainable. I, I think uh, their target is about 50% gross margin. And why this is going up so much is also thanks to uh, some FX effect. Uh. So, so don't, don't be surprised if we see that uh, it go back down to 50% as uh, USD uh, go back to, you know, like, like revert back to, to uh, less stronger uh, or so-called weaker USD. So if you look at the operating margin and net margin, these are very decent numbers. Uh, we're talking about, you know, like 40 plus percent uh, margins, right? But uh, please, one, one thing to note here is that you, you, you cannot assume that just look at the profit margin, say 42%, you can say, oh, TSMC, is it really even better than uh, Apple? Which I, I don't think Apple have 42% net margin, right? So one, one thing to note is that uh, net margin or profits, right, uh, doesn't translate to free cash flow immediately. 
because for TSMC, their business right is very very high capex. So uh, if you listen to Charlie Munger's uh, daily journal uh, a- annual shareholder meetings, you notice that he mentioned something about semicon industry, which is that all the mon- almost all the monies that they earn, right, they have to put it back into capex and buy all this expensive equipment for future growth. So if you look at the free cash flow, it isn't that uh, high. I think you don't have a forty two percent free cash flow margins, lah. So that's one thing to take note uh, on, on TSMC business. But this is true for all other uh, semiconductor industry as well, especially for those that are in the, in the manufacturing side now. So that, please take note on that. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see that it's still, still a healthy margin and, and the margin is still higher than other semiconductor uh, players now. Uh, this is thanks to their you know, pricing power. What about their ROIC, right? Because just now I said that if all the profit, you, you earn the profit, then you put it back to capex, then what does it mean, right? It isn't that useful looking at the profits, but one thing we can look at is uh, their ROIC. Uh, ROIC will actually reflect like, okay, given how much invested in uh, the capital invested, right? What is the return that we get in the past? And if you look long enough, you can see that, okay, if their ROIC is high enough, meaning that even though they put a lot of money into all these capex, buying uh, equipments and so on, but they are getting a sufficient return out of those uh, investments. Uh. So if you look at in the past, uh, their ROIC is like consistently above 20%. And, and this is something that I think is very important uh, because I'm okay with your capex if the capex is giving me enough high enough ROIC, right? So so this is something to to um to assure us that okay, it's not like they earn all the profits and then pull back and then you you will get nothing back uh uh for for foreseeable futures. This is not the case. You you are able to get back the returns one. It's just that when you get back now, uh then then you have to reinvest again. So so, so that's just the dynamic of the business. Okay. Um Again, let's uh, look at the valuations. So, like, like I mentioned, profits isn't a good indicative as in you cannot just assume that $1 profit from uh, TSMC is having the same quality as $1 of profit from, let's say, like uh, companies like Apple. So, so you shouldn't compare uh, the profits of, of different companies or different sectors. But at least uh, for TSMC, what you can compare is that the, the profit or, or the, the PE ratio, right? The, the, the ratio between the price and their earning per share, you can compare against itself. Say for example, as of now, the PE is only 13, but when the price was going up and up uh, during, uh, let's say 2021, because they are showing a very high growth rate, right? Um, their, their PE become much higher, and now they actually came back down to a level that is a lot more attractive. And right now, um, as, as the time of the screenshot is about like 13, so this 13 PE is, you can look back over the past five years, is relatively, at least historically speaking, is a lot lower. So that's why I would say that it is currently at a quite an attractive valuation. And, and this, is, um, this is something that is not surprising because as of now, actually Semicon is in a so-called a winter or, or recessions. And these recessions, uh, as communicated by the management, it could last uh, like, uh, almost like the entire first half of 2023. So during recessions, of course, let's say Q1 result is out, you can see that, let's say the revenue growth isn't that strong, the earning isn't that strong. That's why people don't, don't uh, is, isn't that, you know, uh, bullish to buy into the stocks. That, that's why the PE, we are seeing like 13.1, right? But after the winters is gone, after the growth is back, then, then uh, we, we can't expect to get this, uh, this kind of valuations anymore. Like it, it should mean revert back now, okay? So um, that's, that's on the valuation. Okay, um, I'll just stop here because uh, right now we don't have any slide. Though. Let's say if you have any questions when it comes to TSMC, please uh, feel free to leave it at, at the comment sections. I will address the questions later. If no questions after the sharing, right, I'll, I'll just close this call. Okay, thank, thanks on that. Okay, let's move on to the risk. Okay, uh, of course, when talk about you know TSMC or talk about any business in Taiwan, the first thing that people will voice is that okay, whether China will invade Taiwan or not. Okay, so this is the geopolitical questions that I don't think anyone in the world can give you a convincing answer. If I say that for sure China will not invade Taiwan, I, I think there will be you know people who will jump out to say that's very naive, right? Because uh, the all, all this geopolitical tension between China and US or and and between and and Taiwan in between, right? This is really in, I, I don't think this is for sure. There are there are real uh, tension between uh, these two big nations. 
Um, it's just that whether they will invade or not, or whether they will do other stuff or not, that's the the questions that that I'm I'm I myself also st- still thinking about it. Like I I don't have a clear answer, and I also doubt anyone have has a clear answer on this. Okay, but talking about invasions, right? You know, invasions. This is like you know missile fire into Taiwan and so on. I I don't think I I actually think that this is like a low probabilities now. I I don't think. Uh, the reason is because China, uh, unlike US, right? China they don't have a lot of history like going invade um, uh, other countries. Although they they call like Taiwan is uh, one of their territory, but still Taiwan has been governed by you know like the Taiwan governments for many many years, uh, and Taiwan hasn't been governed by CCP in the past. You know, so so this is like um, I mean I, I, that's why I don't think China will go and invade them. But doesn't mean. It is okay for Taiwan because if China doesn't invade Taiwan, they can do a blockade. So, say for example, they say they, they mark like all these places, right? A, B, C, D, E, and they say this is my area. My missile can anytime fly into this area. So, basically, if they want to do a blockade on Taiwan, it's very very hard for for Taiwan or for US to respond because if missile fly in already, then that that's like outright war. But let's say if it is just a blockade, right? Uh. From US side, they it's very hard for them to respond also because because it isn't like an invasion, right? So if there's a blockade or or any things that stop a uh, ship coming into Taiwan or get out of Taiwan, that will be a huge impact to TSMC business. So I, I think these are the risks that um is always there. Um, even let's say during the time when the the tension isn't that high, the risk is still there. It's just that. For geopolitical risk, I, I think this is something that for us is isn't that uh easy to see. So um that, that's why when it comes to geopolitical risk, I, I would say that my way of managing this risk is just by your allocations. It, it doesn't matter how bullish I uh I, I'm on TSMC, right? I, I can't really put like hundred percent of my portfolio into TSMC. I think we, we need to have some allocations uh and, and cap it at, at somewhere to the level that is you are comfortable. So, so so that that's my way of managing the risk. <laughs> okay, let's go to second risk. Uh, second risk is that the technology may fall behind competitor. Uh, as mentioned by um, I think uh, Munger is that this area or, or semicon right, they have to keep putting money into R and D and make sure that they they stay at the forefront. Because if you just slack right, uh, which is the situation happened to Intel a few years back, you. If they they thought that they are already dominant and then they they just slow down in their R and D and then they don't they don't like advance their process notes and so on or they think that doing all this is like too costly they try to save some cost here and there if you started to, to do that or, or so called mute the customers and don't give enough in return and don't spend enough the R and D if another competitors just come in that then they are they are doing much better than you they will just grab all the customers uh, which is what T S M C have done for for Intel. And we don't know in the future whether there will be another another competitors that that come in and eat their their lunch. As of now, I would say that uh, TSMC is still uh, the best in terms of the technology. But we already see that uh, uh, Samsung already moved from FinFET to GAA. They are not slowing down because they know that uh, FinFET uh, is isn't the future anyway. Anyone, uh, every one of them will still have to go to GAF uh, FET, right? So they already do that and take a bit of risk there. So, so I think this one really kudos to Samsung who, who is taking the risk. So uh, I would say that from TSMC side is that they they know all these threats are here. If they don't see uh, competitors around, right, they might just you know slack down. But but I think they are aware that Samsung is still investing heavily, uh, and that's why they themselves also investing heavily. Uh. So I think as of now, I I think that TSMC is still able to maintain their lead, but. Uh, again, on technology, you can at most see a hit for you know like three years, uh, at most like five years. Uh, beyond five years, anything can happen. Uh. So that's why we have to you know keep keep monitoring the situation and, and then uh, just read out stuff and to, to make sure that if there's sign that um, they are lag behind in terms of technology, then then we need to reposition our portfolio. Uh. So so this is something to watch out. I think when it comes to technology, uh, investment into technology companies, right? These are the things that you you have to pay attention to. Right? It's not just uh, semicon. Say for example, you you invest in Google or, or Alphabet because you think that their search is like really um, like dominate the markets, right? And now suddenly ChatGPT jump up. You you also have to reassess your your view on whether ChatGPT is able to disrupt uh, Google search. 
if the answer is no, then uh, feel free to continue to invest in Google, right? So I think that's that's something that you can do. But if you think that that's a serious threat, so you might want to reposition your your portfolio. But I, as I, I believe that most of my viewers watching watching this, um, uh, you know, like the younger or so called uh investor that they are you know more into tax, right? So so you actually have some advantage there, as in you can understand all these things that um, if you ask those like older or, or those who who are comfortable with uh, uh looking just at the financial statement, you you can't really interpret uh, uh they those people they are not that in in tune with technology, right? So if you have advantage on that, then you can you can actually uh, leverage on that. Now. So I think leverage on your strengths are uh, basically. Uh, and, and all this, although it looks quite technical, but there are uh, enough resources uh, out there that can help us to, to understand these areas. Say, for example, I'm not in semicon industry. Um, I actually have to watch, you know, like YouTube, reading stuff uh, to just know what are the stuff that is happening here. Like why they have to move from FinFact to GA, what are the advantages, uh, why, is, why the manufacturing of GA fat is so much more uh, like costly and difficult compared to FinFact and so on. So these are the stuff that if you just, you know, curious enough, you can find uh, other resources that can help you make uh, the decisions or, or like help you understand uh, at least. In the end, if you don't make money from from you know all this investment, at least you get some knowledge, lah. So I think that that's the things that uh I discuss with Chicken uh, all the time. Like, <laughs> why are we doing uh, individual stock picks, right? At least at least we can become expert in in certain area or so called we thought we are the experts, right? Yeah. So okay, just 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 joking. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one talk about um. Okay, the GA effect just now I mentioned, right? So all this is actually communicated by, by Samsung. Uh, they, they actually say that, okay, uh, FinTech, uh, this is the, in the past they are doing that, but now they are already at GA effect. So, you know, um, around mid of last year, they already announced that they are into three nanometers that is using the GA architectures, right? So, so it just shows that uh, Samsung is, isn't that behind. So they just need to uh, make sure that their yield is good enough. Uh. Whereas for TSMC, you can see that this is the line here. Uh, I hope that you can, I'm not sure whether you can see the um, uh, cursor, but it's okay. You can see that there's this red uh, nano sheets here. This is the GA fat, which will start from N2 onwards. And in terms of the timeline, you can see that this will only come in, I, I don't recall it's whether 2024 or 2025, uh, which is few years later. As of now, they are still at uh, three nanometers and they will have at least like three iterations of three nanometers. It means that they, they are going to stick with fin fat for, for like two to three years now. So they, they are, you know, st sticking it with FinFET because it works. But whereas for GFET, uh, this is still like things that is like two or three years later. They, they will worry about this later. Um, so uh, that's why technology, if people tell you that uh, in terms of technology, Samsung, uh, TSMC is the best, maybe, maybe it's good to bring up Samsung, okay, to say that actually uh, yes or no, because it might not be exactly true. Uh, if you think that GFET is much more advanced, uh, actually, Samsung is even more advanced. I, I think, e even though I, I'm a big fan of TSMC, doesn't mean that I, I just like look at everything that's good with TSMC, right? We, we have to pay attention to the to the competitor as well. <clears throat> okay, next one, talk about utilizations. So just now I talked about utilization is that all, all this like, um, like I mentioned, right, about the um, winter or about the recession in the semicon industry. Uh, actually, these things, right, is not like uh, the general economic where uh, general economy whereby you only see the recessions are uh, like like one or two quarters after it happens. For semicon, the interesting thing is that actually they can see that coming even before it comes. The reason is because you know for companies like uh, TSMC, they they have like you know like more than fifty percent of the market share. They talk to so many customers, so basically they have the insights not just on their customer is actually they have the insight for the en entire industry. Uh, So-called insights right, is that how much, uh, how many orders like all these customer place with them because you, you, you order, it's not like you order now, then I deliver next quarter. It's not like that, you know. They have to uh, give indicative or they need to chop the capacity like many quarters uh, from now. So if they can see that, say for example, now it's 20, early 2023, right? Say if they, if, if you can see that, uh, the customer is ordering less for the upcoming quarters. So they, they already see that coming. So that's why if you pay attention and, and um, just pay attention to the uh, you know earnings call, you, you can have a sense on whether we are getting into recession or not. You know? And as of now, um, the view is that uh, 
first half of 2023 it is the bottom of the cycle and then uh, and end of the year things will be improving but so-called the the bottom of the cycle what we are going to see right is that the utilizations will fall below 100 percent so how to like for for those who are laymen right like utilization is just that to say that okay how much capacity that they have how much of that cap capacity is being used say for example if all the machines all the peoples are like used to the max right they're able to produce let's say like 100 wafers but the customer only uh order 50 wafers that means that utilization is only like 50 percent so that, that's one way to look at it and when the utilization become low uh, it's not just the revenue will get hit, uh, their margins will, will, will also get hit. The reason is because all this equipment that they bought uh, in the past, right? Say all these UV machines, all the, all, all the machinery, all the fabs, these are expenses that is already spent in the past. And whether you manufacture uh, all these uh, chips uh, will, will not affect money you already spent in the past, right? So what it means is that if the utilization drop uh, into very low level, you will notice that the expenses, although some, some expenses are, you know, like variable expenses, it will drop slightly, but the bulk of the expenses is fixed expenses and this will not drop. So if that happens, uh, two things will happen. One is that their revenue will, grow, will drop. Secondly, their, their uh, profit margin will also drop. So, so that's why it is like a double hit during the, the uh, recession. Uh. And uh, what I'm showing here on the on, on the slides here is that before it happens, you see um, as of November, 9th of November last year, right? They already saw that, okay, seven nanometer process capacity utilizations falling rapidly. And then uh, after that in January, uh, they mentioned that the five nanometer capacity also dropped. It will be below 70%. So this is like a uh, very negative news. And then um, the most recent one, which just came out a few days ago, they saw that, uh, five and four nanometer uh, capacity utilization utilizations already started to pick up now so so this is um something that if you just pay attention to the to the uh, news right you can see that whether the utilization utilizations will go up or down but uh to summarize is that um we are going to see some drop in the utilizations for q1 and potentially in q2 um, but after that, hopefully it, it will improve uh, thanks to all these you know, big orders uh, from maybe NVIDIA just to help out to supply enough chip for the, for the chat GPT. I think that will help to push the, the uh, semicon. Okay, that's something to watch out for. Um, okay, just to summarize the entire presentation before I go to Q&A, uh, I mean, these are the key points, right? So... Um, why, why I invest in TSMC is because uh, they are the largest pure play uh, foundry and then they have the best in class in technology and then when it comes to advanced process notes they are monopoly uh, even though I, I wrote it as oligopoly but actually it's like not too different stuff. Uh, the, the most important one is whether they have the pricing power or not because uh, as I think I saw one video coming from uh, that one interview video Maurice Chang actually said actually you don't need uh, like many many customer to to make your products become commodities you only need one more competitors let's say if there's two competitors producing exactly the same thing then that become a commodity already uh, but for tsmc case i don't think that they are they are commodi commodity because as you can see apple they, they stick with uh tsmc because of their reputation because of their um uh like like you know like they they are able to fulfill the orders they have the so-called the reputations now. So, so I think they, they are really happy with TSMC and they will stick with that. So they are not, um, how to say, uh, they, they are willing to spend a little bit more to, to have a good partners like TSMC. And then the pure play uh, foundry models, I think this is something that is uh, big innovations uh, when, and, and this is invented by Maurice Chang when he set up TSMC is that they don't do their chip design. They only do the pure play and that actually uh, avoid a lot of conflict of interest. Say for example, just now I mentioned about Samsung, right? Samsung, when their yield is very low, they, they're only able to produce a small uh, amount of chips. They, they first will have to prioritize their own needs, right? So they might not able to produce enough chips for their customers. So, uh, and same for Intel, although Intel said that they want to move into IDM 2.0, but let's say if they have all these yield problem in the future, should they prioritizing their own needs 
meaning they, are, they, they, they still have to churn up their Intel chips for their PC, right? Or should they prioritize their uh, customers, meaning that other fabulous companies that place order with them? So these are the conflict of interest that isn't that clear, but it's always a problem uh, as long as they stick with the, uh, I, the uh, integrated uh, model. Whereas for pure play, uh, for, for TSMC is that they just allocate resources among their customer. They, they don't have their own needs, right? So they only do pure uh, manufacturing. So this is something that is, um, I would say, superior uh, business model as compared to, to the others. Then again, uh, valuation, just now I showed the chart, uh, is about 13. So I think this is quite attractive, uh, just, I mean, at least compared to historical. And then uh, the high performance computing, the HPC, right, this will be a long-term growth drivers. This one, you just need to ask yourself, right, for example, like now, uh, in terms of like all this AI, do you think that all this uh, AI uh, technology uh, is it just like uh, something like a short-term hype and people just play with ChatGPT for a while then they're boring and they, they just like stop playing with ChatGPT anymore? Or do you think that this kind of technology that will slowly embed into all forms of applications, right? So they will come to our, you know, our Excel, come to our chat, come to our all sorts of software. Uh, if, 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 if we... If it will go to all these different applications, it just means that the demand for computations, right, will going to shoot up, and players like Nvidia, they definitely will benefit, right, and and Nvidia, they still have to rely on TSMC for like manufacturing their their chips, and this is uh definitely good for TSMC, and then they mentioned about all this for for many quarters already. If you track their past, let's say twenty twenty two or even twenty twenty one, when they mentioned about like um. They, when they talk about long-term growth, they always talk about the HPC, HPC, HPC. These are the things that they keep repeating. It's just that back then, uh, it's still unclear, like, okay, what, what are the stuff in HPC that will drive all this, right? We, we know that uh, NVIDIA has been, um, like, producing all this gaming chip and data center already. It's just that we don't see the usage part. And now with ChatGPT, I think we, we already see that, okay, these things is really, really big. Uh, so, so I think this is something like a, a long-term growth. The question is more like, okay, um, yes, if you invest in NVIDIA, which, which is the strongest, fabulous companies producing chip for all this, uh, like, like powering all, all the AI stuff, right? Uh, definitely, I will say that NVIDIA, they have a lead there. Uh, it's just that you look at NVIDIA uh, valuations, it's still not cheap. Whereas compared to TSMC, you can see that the valuation is a lot more different. Of course, one is pure software, the other one, the other one is pure hardware. It's very different. You cannot compare them as if they are apple to apple. But uh, I would say that if you just look at TSMC valuation, I, I don't feel the excitement that coming from all this AI. Whereas for, for NVIDIA, there's a lot of excitement already. But I don't know whether this excitement will, will actually uh, flow into TSMC one day, right? Say, for example, like 12 months from now, if the... Um, let, let's say if the uh, we are out from the uh, semicon recessions and you can see that the growth is really coming back and so on um who knows right the the pe can can it stay at 13 or it will be revert back to like 15 17 20 this one really hard to say right so i'm not not giving prediction i'm not going giving price target i just want to give a, a like an overall um thesis on tsmc like like what are the long-term uh, factors that uh, make me think that this is an attractive company to invest in and then, of course, um, there are things that we cannot overlook, which is the geopolitics, te technology utilizations. These, these are the things that I, I'm watching out uh, from time to time. And when I read their earnings transcript, these are the things that I pay attention to. Okay, um, I think this is not a long presentation. I hope that uh, you all enjoy these presentations. Let's look at the questions, okay? Um, from Bunsung, yes, I can hear you slightly on the soft side. You might need to adjust the microphone sensitivity. Your voice is on the soft side. I think this is when the uh, mic I did, it, uh, got some problem. The live chat is also much more delayed than you think. Yes, this, I'm aware of this. So, so I can't really assume that we are having conversations here. I, I just assume that I'm doing my own solo, uh, solo talking. And then you can leave your comment down below as I read that. Uh, then I can comment on that now. It doesn't appear immediately, so getting immediate responses might not be effective. That's true. From Chicken, Punti looking as handsome as ever. Nice haircut. Yes. Wow. Uh, didn't know that Chicken really paid attention to my haircut. I just got this new haircut yesterday. Okay, from Mark. Uh, good point. I can only remember US invading other countries for the last 50 years. Um, that's true. If, if you look at the, the there's this list, that, or if you're lazy to dig it out, you can just use ChatGPT to, to come out. You can just 
ask like what are the countries invaded by US in the past 50 years I think the list right is a very long list now. so so that's the you know the culture and this is also how US maintain their you know like dominant positions in the world right it's just like they will dictate how other companies do conduct their business say for example I think uh, a bit of history so I, I think I can't remember when was it but let's say it is like a couple of decades uh, ago actually Japan was doing very well when it comes to semicon uh, industry and then uh, I, I think somehow US just f felt that they are threatened and they did something about it in details I, I can't recall what's the exact details but essentially they, they just like almost like kill off the entire uh, Japan industry and Japan they have to like you know change their behavior or, or change their model to a way that is really you know work for the US instead of work against US then now come to China is that if you pay attention actually US also trying to change uh, China it's just that China is you know they are stubborn they, they know that they have a bit of leverage when it comes to all this area that they, they too have a, a bit of tension uh, it's just that they know that first they have the, a huge market so e even companies like um, I mean US companies they, they still uh, uh, have to you know um, ca cannot let go of China market because just how big it is and then they also supply a lot of manufacturing for the entire world so so these are the leverage that uh, China has and because of the the leverage right sometimes even if there's a, some all these tensions right uh, U.S. also cannot be like you know completely just uh, sanction uh, uh, China and and just isolate China um, uh, as if China become like a North Korea. They they can't afford to do so because if they do it that way, right? Uh, it, they themselves also get into trouble. So that's why all this tension is a bit like okay, back and forth, back and forth, trying small things and try to influence each other. It, they they cannot do an outright uh, ban or, or sanction on on China. So because of that, China also because they know their leverage, they also like uh, don't want to you know um, change themselves too much to fit uh, to whatever that US want. Uh, that's why there's tensions, right? So so all this, uh, and you can see a lot of tension in semicon. Okay, so so this is something that. I, I, I actually think that this is not a, a good thing for um, semiconductor business, even for TSMC. Say for example, now TSMC is already kind of forced to build their factory in um, in US, right? So all this, like in terms of like uh, diversifying their capaci uh, capacity, I think this is a good thing. The bad thing is always that, okay, um, TSMC in the past, they also tried to build fab in US, but didn't work out. And there's a reason why they didn't work out right. I think cost is one of the big problem. Um, so and and for semicon, uh, especially for the advanced process nodes, it is the the process the manufacturing itself is very difficult already. So if you put all this manufacturing in one place, right? Say for example, all of them cent uh, centralized around uh, Taiwan, right? At least when it comes to support, when it comes to solving problem. Um, the turnaround time will be a lot like faster you know say for example if you know uh, the engineer saw some problem and then the supplier or or their you know all the software provider and so on they're all situated within um, uh, Taiwan they can have a very quick turnaround and solve the problem and if you have manufacturing in let's say in in all different parts of the world let's say there's any problem and then you have to you know leverage on your supplier which is on the other time zone and so on so if you spread out right it's usually it's actually not that uh, efficient so that's why if you think of it like from an efficiency perspective you want everything to be in one place but now uh, the situation is, is different now um, all these customers say for example like Apple they can't afford like just one uh, like, like let's say blockade from China then they they can't source their chips from Taiwan anymore right so they they have to buy some insurance so so they will push for TSMC to build fabs in in uh, US I think this is like kind of like forced to do so so I will, I will categorize this kind of situation within the the risk factors but doesn't mean that uh, the risk is there then then we don't invest right because as of now the fabs is still running they're still selling their chips things are still working and we all hope that this will continue in the future and hope that the situation between US and China will, will improve but let's say if the situation become bad right uh, turn like, like become much worse I think what happened is that the the problem will not just stay with TSMC. It will spill over because if TSMC is not able to to um, uh, come up with their chips, 
uh, their customer will be affected and their customer, you know, as they have like more than 50% of the market share, companies like uh, NVIDIA, AMD, these are also companies that will, will have trouble uh, in the future. So, so I think um, I, I don't want to downplay the geopolitical risk. I think this is a real risk. It, it's just that um, I, I don't think that just because the risk is there, then, then we stop investing, right? I think that's not the right approach. Um, if for any companies that you invest, I think you you should be able to like clear, see clearly what are the risks. It's just that different company, different sector, different uh, dynamics. The the risk is very different. You just need to be aware of that, and just do your portfolio sizing accordingly. Okay, uh, I will stop the presentation here. Uh, uh, one thing I will just ask from you guys is that please please give some com uh comment. Uh, down the you know the comment sections. Let me know whether this type of presentation or, or this type of like using uh YouTube Live is it much better than Zoom or is it like you, you prefer Zoom and so on. Just let me know. And I hope that uh I'm doing YouTube Live able to attract more viewers as well. I hope that uh, YouTube try to like push my 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 video. So let's say if you can leave a like uh and subscribe to the channel if you are new here. Thank you very much. And and uh, I will end the discussion here. Uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye.